friends! If you're new, my name is Emily. I created Definite Hearing as a way to increase awareness for the deaf and hard of hearing. Recently, I had a little help mishap. I broke my collarbone. If you have not seen the story on how I broke my collarbone, go to my channel, check it out. For today's video, I am going to review my experience in the ER and I am going to share like how it was as a hard of hearing person in the ER and with coronavirus. I hope you stick around to the end of this video for some tips on how to navigate the ER as a hard of hearing or deaf person. If you haven't already, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. I look forward to making more exciting content for you without the collarbone break and other bone breaks, hopefully. All right, so this video is going to pick up where the last video left off, where my family and I decided to drive to the ER because I indeed had a broken collarbone. And so we drove up to the hospital and as we were pulling up, I noticed that there was an elderly couple that literally like got out of their car, walked in and walked back out. And I was like, oh no, they might not be accepting people. It was past 8 p.m. so a lot of urgent cares were already closed, but this bone was definitely broken. So I was a little worried with coronavirus that like maybe they were turning people away, maybe they were too full. So we pulled up, my dad got out and he went and talked to the security personnel that was on site. And the security personnel, I mean, I just saw kind of their interaction. My dad just explained briefly what happened and the gentleman grabbed a wheelchair and brought it right over to our car. So I just kind of like, oh, like slipped into it because at this point, my shoulder was like completely collapsed in. Like I couldn't sit up straight because my collarbone was gone. Like it was just, oh, it was so uncomfortable because my muscles, like my neck muscles and my back muscles were, it just felt like they were just really uncomfortable and spazzing at this point. Anyway, this nice gentleman brought a wheelchair. They wheeled me into the ER lobby and there were probably four or five other parties of two people, uh, each sitting kind of throughout the lobby, obviously social distanced, everyone keeping to themselves. And as we walked in, there was a person there behind a glass that was helping check everyone in. And I was so zoned out because I was in shock that I didn't realize it until my mom got down and was like, Emily, look. And it was one of our old, like one of my old childhood friends. She had lived across the street from us for the longest time. And the last I heard, she had been in police academy and had graduated and had been really enjoying life. And so sure enough, it was so, so fun to see this old friend. And she was so cute because she was like, oh, I didn't think I'd see anyone I knew tonight, but I feel so bad that you got hurt, you know? So it was really fun to see her. It was like such a bright spot in this ER experience. After that, they wheeled me, after they checked the temperature and like gave me a little wristband because they're keeping track of everyone that comes in. And you can only have the injured person or whoever needs medical attention and one companion. So they had one band for either my mom or my dad. And we ended up giving it to my dad because he's the doctor. So we went to the check-in desk and they were asking me for all my information. Okay, there's glass panels, there's masks, I'm hard of hearing <laughs> and in shock. Like it was, woo! I felt so bad for them because I just, I couldn't pay attention as much as I needed to, to like understand what they were saying. So I just kind of bumbled through it because sadly I've been to the ER before. Long story short, with my peanut allergy, I've noticed that about every five years I end up in the ER. Ironically, they were like, yeah, you were in here like five years ago for a peanut reaction. I was like, I know, I was getting close to that timer. And I thought it would be a peanut reaction that brought me here, but it was this lovely clavicle break. Anyway, so I knew what they were gonna ask. Full name and date of birth. And so I just kind of started rattling off my information. The problem is my name had changed. So they had my maiden name in the file instead of my new married name. So that created like a little confusion, but they were able to locate me. They got my bracelet and asked me to look at it and confirm the information. And I was so grateful for that. I did mention like, I'm so sorry, I'm hard of hearing. This is my information. And they took it from there and it was great. And so my parents were there and that was so helpful. I felt kind of like a little kid again because like I needed help. But I think that 
if I would have been there alone, I could have said my information, they would have helped me and had me visually verify that. So once they checked me in, they asked me to go wait in the lobby. And so we just waited there until we were called back. Once we were called back, a nurse came in and asked me to share the story of what had happened. So I told the colorful story of diving for a Frisbee and breaking my collarbone. And so they ordered an x-ray. The x-ray tech came and led me and my dad back to the x-ray room. Now, <laughs> this experience, it was really hard to hear. And I let him know like, hey, I'm hard of hearing, so just make sure when you speak, if you can face me or speak loudly and clearly enough so that I can hear you, that would be great. But due to the layout of the x-ray room, I had to stand in front of the x-ray and he would go behind kind of this wall and take the x-ray. The first x-ray they took, he came back and he was like, are you wearing any metal? And I said, I don't think so. Like I have this t-shirt on and this sweatshirt that my sister had created a sling for me. It turns out that this sling had a metal pull tab on it, like with the zipper that was right in front of my collarbone. So we couldn't see it at all. So we had to remove that. And he was taking the x-rays again and I realized he was asking me to hold my breath while he was taking the x-ray. He didn't explain that to me at all. <laughs> and so all of a sudden I started holding my breath until he said, okay, you can breathe now. And so it was kind of a tender mercy that the first x-ray shots that he tried to take didn't work out because that piece of metal was in the way. But if you're ever getting an x-ray, I highly recommend letting them know like, hey, I am hard of hearing. Is there anything I need to know like holding my breath or holding still? while you instruct me to do so, so that I can make sure that this x-ray turns out right the first time. And just really helping medical professionals know that you need an overview and a walkthrough of what is going on before it happens so that you can know what to expect and have those cues. Because he was behind a wall or a window, I couldn't see him at all. There was no visual cues there until I thought, wait, I think I'm hearing something. <laughs> and I totally was. But between like the shock, the hearing loss, not being able to see, was kind of a lot. Anyway, we got the x-rays. This is what they look like. Crazy, so crazy. It wasn't just broken in two pieces, it was broken in three. So surgery was just a given. Typically with clavicle surgeries, they like have not started repairing them until about 10 years ago. Surgically speaking, usually people would just be put in a sling and healed that way. But due to the fact that there was a middle chunk in there, it did require a plate. So they gave me some pain medicines and sent us home with the instructions to call an orthopedic surgeon, schedule a checkup, and then a possible surgery. So I'm so glad you stuck around to the end of this video because I am going to summarize just some tips and tricks in hindsight that as a hard of hearing person I wish I would have had in place so that my ER experience would have been easier or I would have been able to navigate it without needing the help of my parents because I recognize one, as a hard of hearing person, as an adult, you may not always have someone with you to be your advocate, and so therefore you are your best advocate. And so here are the tips. Number one is patience. Like, it's really hard to be patient in these kind of situations, but the patience pays off. I was in so much pain and I was able to kind of handle it just quietly and just internally and know that like, this pain's gonna pass. It just, it sucks, but it's gonna pass. So patience was kind of the biggest thing that I felt I had control over, that really when other people saw that like, I was in pain but I was patient, they were much more willing to work with me and help me and it really, I think it sped up the process. So though patience is extremely difficult in this situation, it can be extremely beneficial. Item number two is with coronavirus, you can only have one visitor. So if you are able to bring someone, definitely bring someone and uh, let them know and they can help be your advocate. Item number three, as far as the screens and the masks, items that could help with this are a phone transcription app or even a medical bracelet. I do not wear a medical bracelet. Considering the fact that I have a severe peanut allergy, I should. And so those bracelets are just usually metal bracelets that people wear that have their full name and their date of birth. So for example, if anyone were to ever come across me and for some reason I could not communicate whether I'm passed out or I'm just in so much shock, they could look at my bracelet, 
look up my information and be able to contact someone and or take care of me. So a medical bracelet, whether it just has your personal information and or if you are deaf, as in you communicate with sign and are nonverbal, or like this could apply to autism or any other nonverbal situation, you would definitely want a bracelet if you do not already have one, just because that would eliminate any difficulties when initially checking in. And last but not least, this kind of goes with the, if you can take someone with you, take someone. But the last one is definitely be an advocate for yourself. Do not be afraid to say, hey, I am hard of hearing and for this to go smoothly and things to work, I just need to understand what's going on. I can understand what is going on if you let me know beforehand, kind of the process of things. So for example, with the x-ray tech, letting him know hey, I know we're going to go get an x-ray. Can you let me know what the process is? Like when I walk in, I'll stand in front of the x-ray board. You'll adjust things as necessary. And then when you go behind the wall, you'll say, okay, hold your breath. Okay, let it go. Just so it's super clear and concise. I knew I was getting an x-ray. I didn't think to ask for an overall procedure, just kind of so that I knew what was going on. But I think if I would have done that, I would have understood that he said, hold your breath. <laughs> so there are some tips. I definitely hope that you do not have to use these tips, but if you do, I hope that they help you feel more prepared, composed, and patient in the ER environment as a hard of hearing person. If you have any questions for me, please let me know in the comments below. I love using my experience to help others, which is why I created Definite Hearing. I look forward to making more awesome videos for you. Stay strong, stay amazing, and have a great day.